Boz, always good to see you. And Joe Maisley, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm great, Pat. Thanks uh, so much to you and uh, Boz for having me on. It's a real uh, honor to be here. Uh, the the pleasure is all ours. And you Absolutely. Know, for the people at home who don't know you, I know that you're an affiliate owner from CrossFit Marshfield, but um, before I let you tell us a bit about yourself, Boz, why did you specifically want to have Joe on the show? Well, I've known Joe for a long time, and I've seen him through various roles on the CrossFit Games judging team and seminar staff and stuff like that, but Joe's also a firefighter, and one of the things I think he has a lot of unique knowledge on, and it seems like a real passion for, is occupational training and keeping people ready for the demands that their jobs are going to require of them. So I think he's nice. got a really unique perspective across a lot of those different worlds. Uh, well, that's going to be fun to dive into. So Joe, give us just your quick background and bio. What are you all about? Yeah, quick, uh, you know, background a bit. I think um, Boz touched on a little of it already. Uh, currently, I'm one of the co-owners of CrossFit Marshfield uh, in Marshfield, Mass, a little town just south of Boston. Um, currently still work on the level one, level two seminar staff teams. And those are kind of my outside um, passions outside of being a full-time firefighter uh, for the city of Boston. So uh, before all my CrossFit stuff, I was in the Marine Corps for a little while and got out and dove into the CrossFit stuff and then, uh, you know, got into the firefighting and here I am. You know, so when did you, when did you start CrossFit and how did you fall into it? What was that process like? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fun. So it's a, it's a cool story. So I, I um, went the officer route in the military and between my junior and senior year of college, uh, I attended officer candidate school down for the Marine Corps down in Quantico, Virginia. And one of my instructors had said, hey, I think you would really, really love this CrossFit stuff. I think you should look into it. And I'd already been kind of training that way. I did a lot of weightlifting you know, body weight and running and kind of mash them mm -hmm. all together. So I had been dancing around the methodology for a little while, but the traditional gym that I trained at at home had a few Olympic weightlifting platforms and some bumper plates and stuff. So I had been attracted to it for that reason, but they also had an affiliate inside of it. And when I got back from officer candidate school, I went up to the owner of the affiliate who was renting space from them and said, Hey, you know, introduce myself, told them I just finished OCS and this guy, Dave Mesho, CrossFit Cell Shore. He was OG. I mean, he did, he took his level one with uh, Coach Glassman and, you know, I think he became an affiliate owner back in like 2006 or something. So nice. he was, he was one of the, he was one of the OGs in the area. And, uh, first workout was Murph. So that was my, oh, uh, that was, you know, so here's, uh, here's, here's, uh, you know, young, young Joe Maisley coming out of officer candidate school thinking he's, you know, hot shit, you know, Oh yeah, I just finished Marine Corps OCS and just got absolutely leveled by that <laughs> workout. It was like, I think I should keep doing this. So, um, I, you know, that's, I, I never looked back after that. I was like, this is great. And just, um, kept training and trained on my own, uh, a lot at, at school my senior year and continued with it through the military and, you know, when I got out as well. How long were you in the Marines? I was only in for two years. Uh, I had a very serious accident in training and I almost died. Uh, I was in the ICU for a couple of days. And, oh, wow. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah. So a uh, medical board found me uh, unfit for continued duty. Unfortunately, that was a uh, not an easy pill to swallow. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, um, wow. as I'm sure, as I'm sure, you know, Pat, it's like, you know, coming from that, you know, elite community and, and leaving it, especially not on your own terms was, was not easy, but, um, they said, Hey, if you hadn't been as fit as you are, you would have been dead. So I, I was very lucky that I'd been doing CrossFit consistently. So, yeah. No joke. You know, I didn't yeah. wind up in the ICU, but I actually had a, a, an injury that basically stopped my military, uh, career as well you know whether i wanted to continue or not it was no longer going to be in the cards that must have been especially at the two-year mark obviously you weren't ready to just incredibly change what you were doing with your life that must have been um disruptive and scary to say the least 
Oh yeah. hundred percent. But, um, I think, you know, luckily I, I had a very good network of friends and family members and, uh, kind of fell into the, the whole, you know, CrossFit scene. Luckily that's where I put most of my attention towards. And, um, even though I had a job in corporate America, I started coaching at CrossFit Selfie in South Boston after I got my level one, which is basically right when I was, um, uh, right, right by my EAS state. And, uh, so I started coaching part-time and then that wound up to a full-time position when I said corporate America is, uh, not the place, not the place for me. Oh, Shock of boss. I know. Yeah. yeah. I, I, do well I can't a desk. see you with a, with a tie and a nine to five, Joe. I just, no, I don't see it. No. It was not, it was not my style. hundred yeah. percent. It's good to learn that when you're young, you know what I mean? I yes. think a lot of people wait a couple of decades and they figure that one out and then it's like, well, maybe that would have been a good move a while back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, I was fortunate. I was very fortunate in that regard for sure. And so your injury, you know, it doesn't keep you to this day, I assume from doing most of the movements associated with CrossFit or, or are there some things that are still just off the table for you? No, I just, it, it was, um, no, it, it, movement wise, everything's fine. Oh, it was okay, more great. of a, um, you know, kind of systematic. Yep thing and luckily nothing's really uh nothing really has happened since that so been very lucky so how long did you stay coaching at the affiliate as kind of a transition from you know left the left the military wasn't wasn't really feeling the whole corporate life usa kind of a thing you know how long did you do <laughs> yeah. training as your full-time gig six months it was a short transition oh, wow I, I yeah oh yeah i got out of the military in january and uh started coaching part-time right around that, that same time. And, and I made the full transition, I believe the beginning of August, um, it was actually, we went out to the CrossFit games to watch just, you know, um, be there as spectators. And I came back and started at the gym full-time. That's awesome. So it was a nice was, little transition. So yeah. 2011, you said? 2011. Yep. Wow. Cool. Um, and, from, and from there, what was what was the path? And because now, obviously, you are the co-owner of, of a gym. You know, how long did it take from you working at somebody else's gym as a trainer to branching out and just starting your own thing? I, I a long time. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, after about six months at uh, working across at Selfie, I I got hired to work full time at Reebok CrossFit One. Uh, where, you know, Austin Maliolo and Denise Thomas were the head coaches and, you know, Spencer Hendel was there at the time. And so was, um, you know, a few other really good coaches in the area, uh, Lindsey Johnson and Caleb Diebolt. And, you know, later on, we had a whole host of, uh, you know, very, very great coaches and athletes come through that door. You know, everyone from James Hobart to uh, Connor Murphy, Jen Smith, Kelly Jackson, uh, Mel Ockerby, a lot of, I, I was mm -hmm. really lucky to be surrounded by people that were way better than I was um, very early on in my coaching career. Man, that's awesome. So, okay. So you start coaching your in with this early kind of Reebok crew, that's, that's pretty inspirational and obviously sets a pretty good template for behaviors to model, both on the coaching side and the athletic side. Um, I know you dabbled with CrossFit competition a little bit as well. Um, yep. And then, so when did you start transitioning into CrossFit as sport to kind of CrossFit as supportive of your career or how did you get into firefighting and how do those things kind of mix together? Yeah, sure. So I, um, I got on the fire department in 2013, um, in September, 2013. So it's been almost exactly eight years since I got on. And so I competed at the games at the team level with, uh, the CrossFit selfie team in 2012. And that was when I started making the transition. Um, I still, I still trained, you know, pretty hard and I competed at regionals for a couple more years after that, but my training looked a lot a lot different after that, obviously, because sleep schedules changed, stress levels mm. changed, um, you know, a whole host of things. I, you know, used to have aspirations of competing individually and those things were pretty much out the window and it just became a little bit more like, Hey, I enjoyed doing, you know, competing's fun. I, I liked the camaraderie aspect of it and, and having some goals outside of the firehouse. But then I really started to, try to figure out, well, Hey, how do I, 
train intelligently while I'm at the firehouse in order to not only keep supporting my fitness, but more importantly, support what I'm, what I'm doing when I'm on, you know, shift. And so also I assume back then you had a bit more free time, but you didn't have two kids. <laughs> didn't have yeah. two kids back then. So, a lot <laughs> so more you can get a, a second or a second or third session. In the gym isn't that big of a deal. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was so not, let's, yeah, let's it was drill a lot into that a little bit, uh, Jill. What, what can yeah. you outline what specifically some of those changes look like? Because I do think it's really interesting you know, the method of CrossFit is so broad and there's so many different ways that you can kind of slice that pie. Um, I think sometimes it's easy to just bucket it all together and it's like, well, everybody's just doing CrossFit. And you're like, well, yeah, but the devil is in the details. So what are Absolutely. some of those things that, that you modified specifically as you started transitioning towards a busier life, more, um, you know, occupationally fit focused? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, especially now, you know, then I still trained on shifts a fair amount. And uh, I really try to stick to the three on one off um, schedule. And so when I was at the firehouse, um, I believe uh, the episode when you guys had Stefan Roche on, he, he spoke to this pretty eloquently about um, athletes training in season and how, you know, a long time ago there, uh, Coach Glassman had either given a seminar or wrote a paper about saying, Hey, when you're in season, you should just kind of train at meh intensity. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I, when I'm at the firehouse, if I'm training, that's how I usually train is I dial things back a little bit. I add in, um, add in rest intervals. So I'm never really at that. I'm never really at my threshold for very long if at all, because and why? I, why? Well, <laughs> it's a good story. You learn from your mistakes, right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, I already, I already can't wait to hear this. <laughs> oh yeah, so I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I got up early. I was working, I was working a forty-eight back to back one time, and so I woke up early on the second day, and I said, oh, you know, I'm gonna get this quick workout in, and it was on dot com, ten minute AMRAP, ten burpees, twenty wall balls. I was like, oh, I'm just going to knock this out. What could really, be simpler, really Pat? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what could be simpler? Not, Lightweight. Not hard, right? <laughs> not, not hard at all. No fitness involved in this one. So right. <laughs> needless to say, <laughs> at the end of that, I, I went hard in the paint and I was laying on the ground. And uh, the, the company that I, I was assigned to out of the academy and, and was at for about seven years before I recently uh, transitioned to um, – to, to lieutenant and was promoted uh we we went to Congrats. a lot of thank you appreciate it um we're we're a very busy company responded to every confirmed fire in our side of the city of boston which was the busier side of the city so we went out the door pretty frequently and i was laying there on the ground and said we get something serious right now i i am <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm luggage i'm i am a i'm a wasted <laughs> i'm a wasted wasted uniform literally i, mm -hmm. I, I was I would have been useless. So that really just said, I, I can't, I can't let that happen again. So I have to be really smart. It's like, if I train, that has to be, you know, the threshold training has to be very tempered. And if, if I train it all, and if not, you know, I'm doing some type of active recovery, I'll work on, you know, um, some stretching, rolling things out, maybe go for a, a light row or a easy bike or something like that. So it sounds stationary, like you gotta, stationary you, bike. Yeah, you really got to balance that staying ready for the demands of the job and managing your fatigue enough while still keeping fit enough so that you can perform the duty healthfully and, and with all those other things in mind, right? That's kind of the, the, the tightrope that you're walking. So yeah. what, I don't know anything about firefighting. You know, I'll be upfront about that. Is there <laughs> a, like a natural rhythm to most firehouses where you know that around this time of day at this shift, that's going to be a busier time than these other times. And, and so do you try to structure your training around that? Like how do you mentally frame now is a good time to train versus mm -hmm. I probably shouldn't hear? Sure. Yeah. I actually, it used to be in my old firehouse, at least the mornings were, were consistently more quiet. So sometime between that, you know, our shift, um, Technically begins at 8 a.m. We usually I, I usually get in around seven, but um 
you know, that 8 a.m. to kind of 11 a.m. period. You, you, obviously, no day is the same. Of course, you could have fire or what, whatever in that period of time, but consistently, those are usually a little more quiet. Um, and then around noon, things would really start to pick up. And I used to try to train in the afternoons, and it, it, they almost always, I'd always have a run in the middle of, uh, if I was trying to do, you know, a session, I, it, it, I would never get it done. You know, I'd come back and <laughs> start. It sounds like a reasonable, a reasonable strategy. Yeah. You're like, oh, well, yeah. that bummer. I couldn't finish the workout. <laughs> that, that was going to be a, yeah, well. a, a yeah. question I actually have that I know from people from the outside looking in, they want to know if, if you're in the middle of a workout and the call goes out, when you come back, is it, is it done or do you actually restart the workout? I don't restart. I just pick up where I left off. Oh, that's usually. what I mean. yeah, Okay, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. I try to that's remember. Dedication. Oh, yeah, I'm like, all right, yeah. Try. Yep. So if you're I 10 minutes into ways. Cindy, you just do the back half 10 minutes when you when you get back. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then, exactly. You know, you touched on it a second ago and we went by, but I think it's valuable for people not even in a first responder role to chew on what you said a bit about, you know, that you'd, you'd maybe ramp ratchet down the intensity a little bit, you know, and, or do an active recovery or whatnot. And I, you know, Boz and I have touched on this before as, as have plenty of other people that, you know, I had the impression when I first got into CrossFit, it wasn't CrossFit's fault. It was my lack of a nuanced or sophisticated understanding of the methodology that if I'm doing CrossFit, that means at the end of every workout, every day, I am non-communicative puking on the ground, <laughs> yeah. uh, non-ambulatory, and that is how you do it. And if I didn't do that, well, then I clearly didn't go hard enough. And, blah, you know, again, I'm sorry that I ever ever felt that way. I think whether whether somebody is a first responder or not, but if, you just, if you're just a regular human, I don't care what you do for a living, and you want to be doing these sort of workouts, not for weeks or months, but for like years or decades, you need to learn how to, just like we modulate and vary our reps and our loadings and our time domains, you do that with your intensity as well. It's a relative thing. And Absolutely. even doing variance and functional movements at moderate intensity, if that's just how you're feeling, there's a lot of fitness that's going to be achieved in doing mm -hmm. thrusters and burpees yeah. moderately. You're still doing thrusters yes. and burpees. You're not doing dumbbell kickbacks or something like that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're getting a lot of great stuff happening, even if you're not burning it down that day. So even for the non-first responder, I think that's a very valuable long-term sustainability point, quite frankly, that I want to make sure we, we touch on. And, uh, oh, yeah. One one final question before I throw back to Boz about just like specific firefighter workouts. The, the classic one is is that you're right in the middle of something. You, you just punched up the 15th thruster and fray, and then you got to stop, right? And then when you get back, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. The other one is. The other one, yeah. Do you have to work out in your gear all the time, right? To get fit mm. and actually be ready yeah. to be on scene. If you're wearing however much your gear weighs, does working out not in your gear, not on breathing apparatus translate, or do you have to do all of your workouts in gear? What's what's your take on that? I think there's value to both, and um, I, and I'll be. This brings up another interesting topic about kind of long term health and stuff too. Um, you know, if you're on a busy department like we are, and you're exposed to you know the carcinogens and stuff a lot, you know depending on how much you wash your gear mm. it actually might not be the best. Mm. You know what I mean? Like interesting. <laughs> yeah. Might I wouldn't not have thought be of that the at best. All. It, you know, if your gear is not clean, I wouldn't train in it. Cause mm. you know what, that's how that stuff enters your body. You know, mm -hmm. if your pores are all open and you're all hot and all that stuff's in there. Um, there's a lot of studies out there on, on just how much even gear that's cleaned regularly still, you know, contains in it. So I, I never would have thought of that. I, yeah. No, it, it, and I, I didn't either. Um, and I actually used to train in my gear quite frequently and do workouts. I do it a little, a little less now. I, but do I still do it? Yeah. And it's, and it's more, not so much as like doing a workout in my gear, but more so like, Hey, putting my gear on and, you know, practicing some type of skills that are related to, to firefighting okay um you know whether that's you know kind of crawling around searching a room or going up some stairs carrying some stuff you know carrying some stuff and 
you, and then two, it's like, hey, when you're on shift, and this goes without saying, but you should always be, you know, gearing up and and having that. So it's like I feel like you get the reps in too. Obviously, if you're if you're just responding, anyways. But I I think it all depends on what's your what's the what's what's the call volume. Every department's different. I mean, I'm I'm on a very you know busy city department, and that could be way different than you know another municipality that doesn't go to fires as frequently or doesn't have a higher call volume, I'd say that then maybe that's a little more appropriate. But, um, you know, I, I'd say don't not train in your gear, sure. but I'd say just if you're on a busy department, like kind of have that in the back of your mind, like, oh, hey, I went to fire, you know, two hours ago and all my gear is disgusting. It might not be the best idea to, you know, you know, I, I train know, in my gear today. Mm-hmm. I don't know what your take on this is, Boz, you know, but I usually tell people, it's not exactly the same, but it's somewhat related. You know, with this question will come up about, you know, a weight vest. How frequently should I throw in a weight vest just for training? And I think there can be some uh, thought process out there that, well, if I'm throwing on a weight vest, I'm quote unquote making the workout harder. And then if I'm making the workout harder, that means that it's better. And then mm-hmm. when I don't have the weight yeah. vest on, I'm going to be a, a, a comic book hero. And it will, if, yeah. if that was the case, then all of us would just run every day in a weight vest and then we'd take it off for the race and be rockets to the finish line. But that's not how it works, right? You know, there's value in doing it. And especially, I would say if you're a, again, I've never been a firefighter, but, you know, using the military example, if you have some occupation that has you have gear on your body, it's not necessarily the training in that gear all the time will improve your capacity. It's great for variance, but it also might just help you feel how that gear feels as you're saying yep. you're getting down you're moving around you can't catch your breath is this chest plate tight on me is it restrictive i'm not going to panic now that i have this thing on my face as i'm hyperventilating and all of that will make what you do on scene make you a more capable individual when you show up to do your job yeah yeah to me i i you know with as far as weight vest training and stuff like that i agree with you pat i think it's more of a minimalist approach it's a once in a while sprinkle on top i mm-hmm. think you're going to get the most benefit out of it that way and it's almost like a um what's the word it's like it's like a uh, tolerance training in a way like you want to be comfortable enough that you can do everything you're supposed to under those circumstances without feeling like you have to train like that every single day you know what i yeah. mean like that, yeah. that's the way i would approach it um you if know I, if i Joe, had to think about it <laughs> yeah and i thought there was something on dot com a long time ago i can't remember if it was a video or an article or something but i i swear that there was like a firefighter and they did i don't even want to say a study but something along the lines of a crossfitter that somehow they had the data that now when they improve their work capacity across broad time modal domains they were more efficient on o2 at the fire and could get a longer time domain out of Mm. whatever the bottle happened to be compared to somebody with a lower level Mm. of fitness. Is that anecdotal? Have you experienced anything like that? Because I would think that would be a wonderful benefit of staying in shape. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) you know, every time I'm I'm on air, do I try to stay on the block, like, you know, have it go down as slow as possible? Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, obviously some, some scenarios that doesn't happen when, Mm -hmm you know, the situation dictates that, you know, you have to move a little faster and obviously not pay attention to that. But other times, you know, yeah, you try, I I, I think it definitely, I think it definitely is. I mean, it's, I'm just one person Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's so many variables that, that play into that, but I, I have noticed I've been able to stay on air for a decent amount of time and not be super uncomfortable. Um, but I mean, I don't, you know, I, I've never really looked at the full time frame or, um, or, or anything like that. So, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of other factors that, that might go into that, but I think it absolutely helps for, 100%. For, a, for a curious civilian like myself that has no reference to that. Number one, how much does your gear weigh? And then number two, what, what's a time domain you, when you're like, wow, I really sucked down that O2 bottle. And what's a, one of you like, wow, I made, I stretched that one out. <laughs> Yeah. So the, uh, I'd say, I think the average gear is around 70 pounds, you oh, know, wow, full wow. turnout gear, <laughs> helmet, um, 
You're going to notice that. Yeah. Yeah. SCBA. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I think, should you train in your gear? Yeah. And, and, and be like boss said, be, be, um, you know, I know I'm paraphrasing this, but kind Mm -hmm. of functional, functionally comfortable with Mm -hmm. your, your tasks wearing that you don't necessarily have to do it every day, but you should be able to, you know, do all those individual tasks as for, you know, time domain. Like if you're in a building doing some pretty hard work, whether that's, you know, carrying somebody out or, um, pulling down ceilings or, you know, punching holes in walls and stuff like that. I mean, if, if you're really working hard and it's like pretty intense in there, I mean, you may have at most 20 minutes, you know, and I'd say that that's for kind of the, you know, but Mm -hmm. under normal circumstances, if you're walking in there and, you know, that depends. Like if you're, you know, we call it being a first two company. Those are the first people on scene and they're usually the ones that are, um, have a more stressful scene to deal with than the companies arriving after that, that are there supplementing, uh, supplementing them. So I've got kind of a related question around stress. And I think this is something that, you know, can be given some lip service when you talk about fitness, people, kind of throw it into the mix in this nebulous way. Oh, you know, being fit helps with your stress response, yada, yada. But to me, I think there's kind of two distinct pieces of note there. Number one, the unfit individual is going to return to baseline a lot faster after a stressful experience. So for example, you know, I I have a, a near accident on the freeway with a car that's not paying attention. They almost hit me head on. I get startled, my heart rate accelerates, you know, there's a little adrenaline surge there. But my ability to return back down to baseline is, is improved dramatically because I'm fit. Mm. The unfit person yep. is going to have to deal with the after effects of that for a lot longer. And then the second end of that coin is just general stress management. You know, if you have a lot of things going on in your life or you're under intense circumstances, being able to, being able to blow off some steam can be really important. Obviously, yep. firefighting is going to have both of those scenarios as a part of basically your, your yep. daily existence, right? So can yeah. you speak a little bit about stress management and staying fit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, stress management, number one, um, obviously, yeah, the exercise is super important. I mean, I think if um, the statistics out there for um, for firefighter line of duty deaths, you know, number one is still heart and uh, is still heart attacks. So I think oh, that I, th- I think it's the same you, for police officers as well. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I think that that just speaks, you know, to your first point, pretty pretty straightforward from a straightforward perspective. Um. So it's really important from what I do to try to manage that. You know, obviously, number one is is work out. Um. I uh, I usually try to work out the next morning after, like, if I go to a pretty legit call or a a fire like i try to work out the next morning and just try to you know flush everything out or if it's you know i have something in the middle of the day or early on i try to work out in relatively close proximity to that you know and and not smash myself but move in uh in sweat and everything like that but uh get get like kind of a natural reset almost right yeah yeah, exactly. Just kind of flush the system and sweat, sweat it out, I guess, is uh, yeah. the non-scientific, uh, non-scientific, you know, explanation for that. But outside of that, I really have paid a lot more attention to, um, you know, nutrition. Uh, it, it goes without saying, and I mean, we, you know, this, you know, CrossFit and GPP and, and what we're looking for out of our program crosses th- so many different disciplines. And, you know, it's really important to, you know, try to have my lifestyle stuff dialed in, you know, number one first is, is nutrition. And then after that, um, just trying to figure out how to optimize my sleep habits. Mm-hmm. And, um, so those don't get yeah, disrupted I've, at the firehouse, do they? <laughs> no, never, <laughs> <laughs> never. I, um, it, you know, and I'm not, I'm not one to say that, um, that gizmos or gadgets are the end all be all because like, let's face it, you know, it, it comes down to ourselves, but I do think there's some utility in some tools. And, um, I got a, I got a whoop strap years ago, uh, because I was interested in 
and what my sleep looked like at the firehouse and how to optimize that and see what habits were and were not effective. So some things that I found just effective for me are, you know, trying to go, trying to sleep at a set time. Like if I wasn't out for a run, it's like, regardless whether firehouse or at my house, go to bed, be in bed by like 10 o'clock. That's my goal. Obviously now with kids that sometimes fluctuates a little bit, but that's my goal. And then usually before bed, I found that some, you know, stretching for, you know, it's, it's, mm. uh, short as five minutes and a little bit of, you know, breathing exercises or some, some meditation before I go to bed really has, has helped me, um, have recover a little bit better and, and, and get some more optimal sleep, even when that sleep is disrupted. Yeah, nice little calm nice. down time before you yep. your head hits the pillow. Yeah. I, you know what shocks me, and may again maybe uh, from a civilian perspective, I'm I'm wrong. From what you have described, I I don't understand how somebody could hear what you do for a living, being on bottle, putting on seventy pounds of gear, having to <laughs> respond whenever the call comes in, maybe back to back, everything's disrupted up and down flights of stairs, drag somebody out, rip down ceilings. I don't ha understand how anybody could be involved in this occupation or line of work and be like, you know what? I'm just not really big into fitness. Just don't really yeah. see the point of working <laughs> yeah. out that much. Totally that, agree. That, how how yeah. I can't even reconcile those two concepts in my head. So in the world of firefighting, because I've seen firefighters of all shapes and sizes. We've seen that, right? Do we? <laughs> yeah. Do we? Yeah. Do we? Sure. Are, diplomatic some, of you, Pat. <laughs> some some that look like uh, you know some that make the firefighter a, a calendar every year, and some that didn't quite make the cut. Let's go ahead and say that. <laughs> they would have been the thirteenth month. I'm right. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is is there a culture of physical fitness and readiness, which to me would seem so obvious, uh, or does it? change from firehouse is there an old school mentality that's changing what's what's the vibe from your perspective yeah i mean it, it varies house to house um and i think generation to generation and i i don't i don't think there's really one answer that can perfectly gloss over that is is that it's situationally dependent i think that you know the younger generation and that has more knowledge and education and how important it is values that a little bit more but i i think regardless of what the background in that education or experience you know regardless of that if you care about fitness you just have to lead by example and mm -hmm. i think that that's kind yeah. of the i think that's kind of the the best answer i could i could have to that is it doesn't really matter what what the culture is like if you know what what optimal versus not optimal is you should try to you know try to live that more optimal way as much as possible and i mean I've, you know guys have looked at me sideways when i you know come in with the with the scale at the firehouse when i'd be weighing and measuring my food and i'm like just go ahead of me guys i'm the weirdo like whatever you know <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. Gotta own it. Yeah. i'm sure they yeah. Oh, yeah. also just see oh, the yeah. Yeah, just make I'm fun of myself, yeah. I'm sure they also see, you know, what that yields on the other side. Sure. Is there yeah. a physical readiness or any sort of annual test to make sure that people have some sort of baseline level of proficiency? Uh, not currently on our department, but every department is is different to um, to that respect. Gotcha, you know? okay. And, um, well, yeah. so to get back to something you said, Joe, and I think that this is so true in almost every aspect of life, regardless of what your profession is, regardless of, you know, the community you find yourself in, is that the best thing to do is lead by example. I'm, I'm a firm believer yep. that that is the case for sure. most situations. So that being said, let, let me put a little pressure on you then. What, what is sure. it that you do to try to lead by example? And as an extension of that, what do you think are some easy steps that other people that find themselves you know, in a firehouse or at a police department or at part of their military unit or whatever, anybody that requires fitness to do their job and keep them safe. What is some advice you could give to them to lead by example? And what have you found that doesn't seem to work? I think if you try to try to tell people that you have all the answers, that will not work. <laughs> that will not bode for you. That will not bode well for you. 
Um, yep. I, I, I'll, I have not tried that, and I because I knew that I know that would never. It's been my experience, work. especially as as like a younger, yeah. uh, like junior member of a team. If you just tell people that you you've got the way, and that you yeah. know, kind of t- talk down to them a little bit, that's yep. usually pretty helpful, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> usually goes over well. So I, yeah. I've been the I've been one of the junior guys because I was most of the guys in my firehouse I got appointed to were were far senior to me. So I was a junior guy for a really really long time. Um, and I, even, even now, you know, I'm still one of the younger guys, um, relatively speaking on our job. So, um, I, I'd, I'd say that I, I bring my lunch mostly every, um, every tour that I work. Um, so, you know, when guys see me eating, they, they see, you know, cause everyone sits down at the kitchen table and eats. So they always see what's, what I've, what I've brought for lunch at, you know, at dinner time, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm always, I, I'd say this, like, I'm not one of those guys. It's like, oh yeah, I'm out of the meals. Like, that's not a thing. Like if it's spaghetti and meatballs and there's a side salad, like I'll just eat more meatballs and beside salad and, you know, have, have a little bit of spaghetti, you know, and, and there's, um, I think that there's, you, you can have, you can do both of those things, be respectful to the guys and also have intelligent conversations about why you're doing what you're doing and not and and be more educational versus kind of dictational if that even makes sense but oh, for sure. um, so so when you're working out is it do you have like an open invite are you public about like hey I'm about to go work out anybody want to join me do, do you do anything like that and if so how's it been received yeah the um like I said most of my experience has been at my last firehouse, the new, um, where I am right now, I'm, I'm filling in a little bit and, um, you know, different it's, it's has a little bit different culture than the other one, but, um, the last group I was on, um, for about, we were together for almost man, maybe four, four or five years. Um, we worked out together quite frequently. Um, awesome. our, our Lieutenant on the group is, it was pretty much all former military guys you know, couple of, uh, SF guys, couple, couple knuckle dragger Marines, uh, you know, myself, I include myself in that. And, uh, you know, so, so we, we trained together pretty frequently. And even if we were doing, um, I, you know, different things, I, I did some, uh, group led workouts for a little while. Um, and, and yeah, and, and those are great. And, but I think too, it's just like, Hey, we're just coming down and working out and kind Mm -hmm. of, you know, people no would ask each other. Yeah, no pressure. People would ask each other questions, but you know, it, it was definitely, it was cool that a lot of people bought into it. Yep. And I, and I think that, you know, kind of, I, I know I'm circling far back to this, you know, thing about, you know, the culture, but it, it's, it's, I feel as if my department's there's a lot of former military folks in my department. And so a lot of us, understand that value of fitness and how much it plays into operational readiness. So, you know, there's definitely a large percentage of guys in our job that, that really do put a lot of value into that and, you know, do work, you know, work out in some capacity. And have you found that little by little, you just get, you know, without pushing on anybody, a couple questions about, Hey, why are you eating that? Or, Hey, I saw you you know, could I join you? Does, do those conversations start just on their own? Usually. Yeah. People are just like, Hey, what are you doing? Cause if you're not, I think if you're not standoffish about it and not very aggressive about it, and you're just kind of like, Oh yeah, man, I'm just doing my thing and, and be as nonchalant and as humble about it as you can, that people naturally kind of start to ask you that stuff. And I've had some really good conversations with some of my coworkers about, you know, everything from nutrition, to, Hey, what do you think I, I should be doing to get some more strict pull-ups? And, you know, even if they're oh, not doing nice. CrossFit, it's, yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it, it's, it really runs the gamut and um, you know, they're, they're great conversations. And, you know, some of the guys have, you know, actually given me some good feedback. It's like, Oh, Hey, I, you know, stopped putting sugar in my coffee. Like, let me, uh, let me, you know, uh, I feel, it's, it's cool. Mm-hmm. Let me put on my armchair psychologist hat for a moment. <laughs> and, sure. you know, this is coming from a, uh, a Canadian kid that grew up where our idea of a military where I grew up is we had a, an Air Force base close to my hometown. And it was literally, I think, one jet behind a chain link fence. Like that's, <laughs> that's about, that was about my exposure to 
these types of communities, you know, so obviously through CrossFit, I've, I've rubbed shoulders with people from those types of backgrounds a lot more than, than I had in my younger life. But anyway, all that to say, I'm speculating that there's a certain amount of vulnerability, even in like a very kind of, uh, I would say, predominantly masculine and, and kind of macho environment that can really be difficult for people to overcome if they're talking about things like health and fitness. And, and, and maybe I'm reading that totally wrong, but I think it's probably compounded in a situation like that where you have a guy at the firehouse or in a unit who, you know, he's supposed to be self-sufficient. He's supposed to know how to take care of himself. And so the very act of asking, hey, mm -hmm. what are you doing? is kind of like a soft prod to see if this is safe territory to explore. Is that, is that way off base or is that kind of consistent with? Yeah. I mean, I, I think yes and no. I think too, I, I think a lot, I think it just, again, it depends, but I think what it mainly comes down to is trust. Like, Hey, do, do your guys trust you? And, and, and that is obviously something that is, is earned through a whole gamut of experiences and situations that, you know, fitness is, you know, just a small percentage of. Yeah. So I, I think yeah. it's just, it, it, I think it's, Hey, are you an approachable person just in general? Are you the guy who comes in and says, Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Or are you the person mm -hmm. that just comes in in the morning? And, and I mean, I, I don't think it's unique to firefighting. I think it's, uh, sure. I think it's, yeah. I think this, I think it speaks to, you know, really whatever profession, profession you're in. And, um, you know, I, I've had some, you know, very valuable conversations, um, with some of my, you know, coworkers on the, uh, fire department. And, you know, we shared a lot of, uh, personal things together and gotten through some things together. And, and I think too, that, you know, on the surface that, that might seem like it's the case is guys are more closed off, but too, I, I think working in professions like that, you know, the, the men and women that are there in those professions obviously will, you know, will, will work, will help each other through yeah. Yeah. other situations that they're, they're going through to trust one another because you're, you're in close quarters, you know, for, mm -hmm. you know, days at a time and, and it's important yeah yeah, it, well, yeah. that's you know one well, of the uh critical aspects of just having a happy life but especially in an occupation like yourselves where it's not hyperbole to say that your lives are in each other's hands like literally yeah, right yeah, and yeah. anything you can do to build trust to build effective communication to build a tighter more close-knit team is only going to help and that's probably one of the intangibles mm -hmm that anyone who's done CrossFit knows that that occurs, but it's, it's tough to scientifically measure that. I can tell you that you're deadlift improved, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, but, but building a team, you know, there was, again, somebody that was interviewed on CrossFit, and I think it was an older Marine, I uh, was just talking about leadership and building teams, and he oversimplified it into, if you want to build camaraderie in a team, it's a combination of laughter and suffering, both together. And I, I think, and I think that encapsulates yeah. it it's so well. <laughs> and the and you get both during yeah. physical fitness and exertion and CrossFit, and, and your guard gets down. You become vulnerable. You yeah. poke fun at each other. You're suffering together, and all of that I would assume is going to make that firehouse a tighter unit when they show up on scene. Yeah, everything's better. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, I've I've got one more question, Pat. This is kind of my. Oh, last hey, you curiosity take, here. Take us out, man. Take us out. <laughs> okay. Okay. So my last question, Joe, is like, you've kind of had this really cool transition from, you know, dabbled in CrossFit on your own, you know, you're young and fit, you got into the competitive aspect of it, you got into a career that really demands that you stay fit, kind of shift your training to that side of the spectrum. So during that kind of process, which is obviously years long, can you pinpoint anything that you've changed your mind about? Like, what is it? What was something that when you started CrossFit, you were like, well, this has to be the way that I go forward. But now, you know, you fast forward a decade and a half and you've got kids in a different career path. What, what's something that you changed your mind about? I, uh, it's definitely what Pat 
I, you know, talked about earlier is it's like, I have to hit every workout as hard as I possibly can at, you know, maximal intensity and that there is a, you know, maximal intensity and high intensity are, are total opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think that that is, you know, one, one piece of it and the other piece is how important recovery is. So hold on, hold on um, for clarity. You, you used to think that it was, it was super all, necessary yeah. to, and now you've straight away from that, myself. Right? Okay. Yes. And, and <laughs> now, it. and now do, I mean, do I, do I still train really, really hard when I'm outside of the firehouse? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. Would I say that I still, you know, hit maximal intensity on a, on a relatively regular basis? Yeah. And I think it's necessary for my, you know, ready state fitness, you know, which is what, what we're after. Yep. But, um, but you don't, you, know, you don't I feel think, like you've wasted a workout if you didn't absolutely destroy no. yourself. Right. Yeah. No, no, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And that's, yep. sorry, I cut you and, off. You had, you had a second piece in there too. Yeah. And I just, I, you know, I, I focus a lot more on the recovery aspect of it too. And it's like, it doesn't have Got to it. be this crazy, you know, you don't have to go to a 30 hour yoga class or, you know, do, you know, 50 minutes of mobility work, you know, five mm-hmm. minutes of stretching and foam rolling and, you know, just some, some general self care on a consistent basis are, are really beneficial. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's, that's all I've got. Yeah, Pat. no, what's, that was wonderful. No, that's, that was, that was fantastic. Joe, I just want to say, as always, I truly appreciate you sharing what you know and spending a little bit of your day with us so that everybody else can learn from what, what you've experienced. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks for having me guys. It was a uh, pleasure to be on here. Of course. Yeah, and, and, hey, Joe, it, real, real quick, if anybody wants to yep. get a hold of you and, you know, we have anybody listening that mm. wants to try to implement fitness as a part of their job, whatever that job happens to be and with the cadre of people they're working with, um, if they want to reach out to you, how can they get a hold of you? Sure. Um, probably easiest way is uh, via uh Instagram, my Instagram is just at Joe Maisley, all one word. Um, I also do a, uh, a little programming thing on the side. It's uh, called Grid Athlete. So just at Grid Athlete, all one word. And that kind of focuses a little bit on more on some of the, um, you know, aspects of training on duty and stuff like that. So, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, well, happy to help out in any way that I can. Yeah, once again, thank you very much. I, I enjoyed it greatly. And as we always say at the end of these, to anybody listening in just an audio format, of course, thank you. But I encourage you to go to the BTWB YouTube channel, leave some comments under this video. Boz and I read them. That they, they help us create future content. And Joe might get on there, check them out. Maybe you've, you've got a firefighter as well. If there's something we should have touched on that we didn't leave them in there. Maybe we'll have Joe on again in the future, have a round two. So... For everybody listening, we appreciate it, and we will see you next time.